My name is Becky Hoy, and hi, Harvard said hi, thank you, oh my goodness. Um, I am on the team here at Crossroads. Right now, I spend most of my time over at Crossroads North. Any Northsiders here? We sleep in. We go to second service, so we're going to come next service. Um, before I was spending most of my time at Crossroads North, part of my responsibilities here at Crossroads South were to help lead out our student ministry. It's called Generation Now. Generation Now goes to first service. Um, Generation Now, and I loved it. It's a fantastic group of students, 6th through 12th graders, um, and we would often play this icebreaker called Two Truths and a Lie. And if you've never played before, here's how it goes. You are ready to give three facts about yourself. Two of them are true, and one of them is a lie. So if you've ever played this game for any significant length of time, you know that you need to have at least one really surprising truth about yourself just to throw them off the trail of what is true and what is not. Um, and so at Gen Now, as I said, we played this all the time, and I did. I had one surprising truth about myself that I would always share. All the Generation Now students and leaders are probably like, which one is it? It's the fact that I'm a black belt. Um, and yeah, that's the reaction I usually get. That's why that's my truth. Um, I'm actually a second degree black belt. Um, I studied Tung Sudo, which is a really old, really awesome Korean martial art. And um, yeah, it was, it, it's fantastic. It's one of the accomplishments that I'm most proud of. And um, when I tell people that, when I tell people that I'm a black belt, their reaction is one of two things. It's either, are you sure? <laughs> or prove it. Right? Because I don't necessarily look like what you would imagine a black belt to look like. So I thought this morning, while I have captive audience, I would prove it. And I have a, a video here that Drew's going to play for us. <laughs> I have a video. So that's me. And that's a cinder block. So you can kind of guess where this is going. It is a real cinder block. It is a real cinder block. It's me being picky. My, this is my pep talk. Here we go. Come on, Pat. Elbow up. Elbow all the way up. Twist. Right through it. Keep up. I'm nervous watching. block cut my hand, but it landed. But it was fantastic. And that was such an incredible moment for me, partially because that is the moment when people run up to you and ask, how do I sign my kid up for martial arts? Right? They're like, you can do that. My kid can definitely do that. <laughs> <laughs> so there, we have all these parents and even adults who come and say, how do I train with your studio? And um, I think that's fantastic. That's really a moment of awe um, to watch someone do something like that. The following clip after that, which I don't have, is actually my instructor breaking seven cinder blocks with his elbow. So it just, it's, it's a moment of amazement, right? Um, what they don't see in that video and what, what they don't see there at the demonstration is the time that I cried at my blue belt test because I had accidentally elbowed someone in the mouth and I had to do push-ups for half an hour. And they don't see all of the time, the years and hours spent in the studio training and preparing and strengthening and conditioning to get to that moment. Because there's no breaking cinder blocks without strengthening and conditioning and preparation. They don't see the blood and the sweat and the tears that it took to get to that moment. And those private moments in the studios, those moments where I was gathered with other black belts who encouraged and supported me, those are so precious. Those are so precious to me, and I wouldn't give them up for anything. But I wouldn't necessarily expect someone to look at them and automatically think, well, that looks like fun. I want to do push-ups for a half hour, too. That's a, I want to sign up for that. And I think this morning, as we dig into Scripture, we're going to see that it is very much the same when it comes to our walk with Jesus 
and our walk with our family, our community of believers that's all gathered together. We're going to see that our private, precious moments together are truly meant to be public. Our private, precious moments are meant to strengthen us so that we can then go out, be sent out into the world, into the streets, and break some cinder blocks. We are meant to be strengthened and conditioned and trained so that we can go out and bring healing and love and justice into the world in a way that is amazing, in a way that speaks to people. Pastor Chad put it this way last week. He said, because of resurrection, because of Easter Sunday, We are called to be an army of peace. We are called to be an army that is united, not not around what we're against, but instead united around a common mission, God's mission for us to go out and make the world look more like heaven. Chad said, because we are followers of Jesus, because of the resurrection, each and every one of us, has been given the authority to walk out into the world, onto the street, and exercise God's power. It's what we do. People who follow Jesus exercise God's power in the world. And so this morning, as we look at the book of Acts, we're going to ask ourselves, what does it mean to be an army of peace? What does that mean when it comes to the rhythms of our lives? the way that we encounter each other and encounter the world? What does it mean to go out and be Jesus in our community? So before we go any further, um, please just pray with me. Lord, we know that you are already present here with us. And we know that, that every single time we listen, You have something to speak to our hearts. God, we intentionally, we intentionally open our eyes and we open our ears to be able to hear you and to understand you this morning. God, through through all the ways that we encounter you today, through worship, through prayer, through your word, we just ask that you would be gentle with us in broken places. We ask that you would be firm with us where we need a firm hand. God, and we ask that that you would be clear that when we're not understanding, that you would just keep speaking because we do want to hear you and we do want to know what it is that you have for us. Guide our hearts. Amen. So we are going to be um, digging in to God's story this morning in the book of Acts. So if you want to... um, Grab your Bibles, or I'm a millennial, so I have a Bible app, um, and start flipping there. That's that's where we're going to be, Acts chapter 5. And what we're going to see this morning is the early church, those first followers of Jesus. And we will see that they look very different than the last time that we encountered them. Right? Last time, as a whole family, that we encountered Jesus's followers, they were what? They were locked in a room. They were locked in a room. I think Chad used the word hunkered down. I think that's a West Virginia word. They were hunkered down. (laughs) They were hunkered down together in a room. And they were hiding out because they saw what the world did to Jesus. And they said, no, thank you. That's not what I'm trying to go after in this moment. But Jesus came to them and Jesus said, I have big plans for you. You can go out into the world and do big things. And so where we pick up this morning, we're seeing those same followers and they're doing it. They're going out. They're no longer hunkered down in a room. Now they're out in their community. We're going to hear that they're gathering at a place called Solomon's Porch. or It says Solomon's Portico. And when I first read that, (laughs) my first blank reaction was, who's Solomon? Like, which of the apostles has the party house that they're all hanging out at? But that's not, <laughs> that's not what we're talking about. It's not a private home. Solomon's porch is actually a very public outdoor area connected to the temple in Jerusalem. So we see the early church gathered together outside at the temple in public, largely doing what we're doing right here, 
having porch time, gathering together to pray and hear from the Father, to read scriptures, to talk about God's love, to worship him. And what we'll see, again, looks very different from what we saw shortly after Jesus was crucified and resurrected. What we'll see is a community that not only gathers on the porch, but then takes everything that they've been given in their time together and goes onto the street where it overflows in the form of healing and love and compassion. So let's read together. Acts chapter 5, we're going to start at verse 12. I love this thing. I don't know who came up with this, but it's awesome. All right. Now, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together in Solomon's portico, Solomon's porch. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. People flocking to the place where the Jesus followers were gathered. But notice, notice what it says. It says, not, none of them dared join them on the porch. And I'm sure there were plenty of reasons that the community in Jerusalem and around Jerusalem didn't dare join the apostles, the followers of Jesus, as they were gathered together on the porch. But here's what strikes me from what we just read. That didn't stop the church from going out onto the street. That didn't stop the church, the followers of Jesus, from ensuring that people's needs were met, that their community had the opportunity to meet Jesus whether or not they came on the porch with them. Here's what I think is important there. The actions of Jesus' followers are never influenced by the inaction of other people. Let me say that again. The actions of Jesus' followers are never influenced by the inaction of other people. It didn't matter that the community was not ready to come onto the porch. We see those earliest followers coming together and going out and making a difference in the world. What we don't see is them complaining that no one wants to join them on the porch. What we don't see is them saying things that I've heard myself say, like, well, they need to meet Jesus. They should come to worship with me, right? We don't hear them saying, well, they need to know what's good for them. They just don't know. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. That's not what we hear. What we hear the church say is, let's gather together, be filled with God's love, and then go out onto the street where it overflows so that can, people can meet Jesus right where they are. We're meant to be filled when we're gathered and then sent out to share the overflow in the form of love and compassion and healing. This time together, this porch time that we're in, this Sunday morning worship, family night gatherings, our, even our personal one-on-one -on -one time with the Lord, none of that is meant to be kept to ourselves. It's all meant to be a training ground. It's all meant to be the location where we are strengthened and encouraged and trained and set out. You know, it's easy for me to let myself believe that disciples are created on the porch. It's easy for me to believe that the best way that I can tell the people I love about the love of Jesus is by getting them to the porch, by getting them to the place where I naturally talk about Jesus. It's easy for me to let myself believe that Jesus said, invite people to worship. And I promise I'm not saying that this is not an important place for our friends and family to be, because if I was saying that, I think Chad would never let me preach again. It's not what I'm saying. 
What I am saying, though, is that the love of Jesus is often experienced first in the world in the form of us meeting the needs of every single person that we encounter. We often think, I was broken. My friends are broken, and I was broken. When I was broken, I needed Jesus, so I need to invite them to meet Jesus. My friends are struggling. I was struggling. I needed Jesus. Let me invite them to meet Jesus. But again, Jesus, God's love doesn't only exist at crossroads at 10 and 1130. God's love doesn't only exist in our living rooms during missional community family nights. It's there. Those are precious moments where we get to intentionally encounter it. And those are so powerful to us because they are that precious. But because, because of those moments, God's love, Jesus, also lives in each and every one of us. And we can bring it with us every single time we step off the porch. You know, it's really interesting um, in, that, in that chapter from Acts that we read, the fact that it says people didn't dare to join the early church on the porch, right? But it also says multitudes were added to the Lord's people. That's not really how we see the church working, is it? That's not usually how I think about the church, that even though people aren't with me on Sunday morning, that they're still beginning to be drawn towards the love of the Father, that they're taking those first steps towards knowing and loving Jesus through the actions of myself and other followers all week long. People flocked. People flocked to the early church, not because there was an awesome worship band or because there was great coffee or wonderful speakers. They flocked there because the early followers of Jesus went out into the street and met needs. They brought healing and love and compassion and kindness. And people said, well, if that's what's happening on the porch, if healing and love and compassion and kindness and forgiveness, if that's the overflow of porch time, then maybe I should be a part of the porch too. What we do on the streets, what we do in our workplace and our homes, what we do in the checkout line at the grocery store or at a restaurant when our server's having a terrible day, all of these things point, I was a server before, so I'm going to make that reference a lot. It's very important. Treat servers well. Um, All of these things, point back towards what we're getting when we're gathered together. They point back towards and they give the world a glimpse of what we're getting when we're gathered on the porch. Um, As I said earlier, my husband Randy and I um, helped to lead out the Generation Now student ministry team, uh, I don't know, maybe seven months ago. Um, We moved over to the north side. But before that, we were with Jen now, and we went and took a group of students to Wayfair Camp. Wayfair Camp is incredible, and um, it's in North Myrtle Beach, and we spent seven days having fantastic porch time. We spent seven days encountering each other and encountering the Father and being consistent and vulnerable and honest. And we worshiped together and prayed together and had really insightful and meaningful conversations about what God was saying to us. And then towards the end of the the week of camp, um, we had this service project scheduled. And we were meant to go out to a park and pick, um, like, weeds and whatnot. And they said to all the youth leaders, they said, it's too hot. We can't do it. So instead... We're going to buy thousands of water bottles, and we're going to give them to your youth groups, and you guys are going to pray for where God would call you in North Myrtle Myrtle Beach, and you're going to go out and give these water bottles to people all over North Myrtle Myrtle Beach. And if that's all you think your students are ready for, that's fine, but we would encourage you to consider talking to them about how Jesus is the living water and encouraging them to not only meet a physical need with water bottles, but to meet a spiritual or emotional or relational need by offering to pray for people. And my eyes about bulged out of my head because I'm from the Northeast (laughs) and I'm from a church where we didn't talk about Jesus a whole lot. (laughs) 
I, I am from a church where we definitely didn't talk about Jesus to strangers. That was not part of where I grew up. I hope no one from my old church ever listens to this. I still love them. They're wonderful. Um, so I brought that to the rest of our leadership team, and Beth and Mike and Mark and Randy, they were like, let's do it. I believe in our students. I was like, all right, guys. So brought it to our students, went out to the boardwalk. I was paranoid about losing one of them. So I had this whole, like an army, right, this whole mission plan set up, and we lined the boardwalk so we'd have eyes on students at all times. And we watched your students walk up and down the boardwalk, passing out hundreds of bottles of water and praying for hundreds of people. And they were bold. And they prayed over families who were experiencing divorce. They prayed over people who were sick. They prayed over people who were broken. They prayed for safety. They prayed for financial hardships. They prayed for one woman whose daughter, I think, was waiting for a heart transplant. They brought so much hope and joy. And it was such a powerful moment, I think, for the people we encountered and also for our team and our students. And I know that that ability to go out into the street and bring healing and love and kindness to meet needs, that ability was directly related to the way that we had experienced porch time over seven days. That was related to us and our ability to be honest and vulnerable and consistent in worship in a gathering together on the porch for an entire week. A lot of people don't want anything to do with the porch aren't interested in gathering with us on the porch because too many times they've seen me come off the porch and instead of bringing love and patience and kindness and healing, sometimes I bring chaos. Sometimes I add to the brokenness. I add to the destruction. And they look at me and they say, well, if that's what's going to come off of porch time, if that's what comes off of the porch, then I don't know if that's a place I want to be. And we hear it all the time. One of, one of the things that I hear really often is, um, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Or I hear my friends tell me that um, they, they like Jesus, and they believe there's a God, but they're really not into organized religion. And what they're really saying is, I haven't seen a lot of healing on the streets, so I'm not so sure about porch time anymore. I'm not so sure why you spend time on the porch if the healing isn't happening in the streets. Jesus flips all of that on its head, as he does so often with our understanding of the world. He flips it all on his head, and he, it's, and he says, let me allow you to experience my love before I explain it to you. Let me allow you to experience the byproduct of our time on the porch, our time gathered together worshiping the Father, before I explain to you why we do what we're doing. Let me meet your need. Let me extend healing and grace and love to you right now in this moment exactly where you are. My husband, Randy, um, uh, some of you might have met him. He's an awesome guy. He has three great loves in life. Number one is Jesus. Number two, I hope, is me. And a very close third is anything with wheels and an engine. He spends as much time as he can in the garage. And to me, it doesn't make sense always. Because I look in and I see him sweaty and I see him with calloused hands and, and I see um, parts breaking and things clanking on the floor and he's rolling around on the cement and covered in oil and probably ruining his last pair of decent jeans. So I don't always get it, but what I do get is the fact that I have a 96 Toyota with 180,000 miles on it that's not trying to die anytime soon. That I understand. And so I look at garage time differently. I say, I get garage time. I understand why spending time in the garage is a worthy investment. It's the same way when it comes to our relationship with the world and the way we tell them about why we gather together on the porch. We can't write off the world because they don't understand it. We can't write off the world and tell them, well, I extended the invitation to worship or I extended the invitation to family night. They need to take the first step. We've already experienced that love. We've already experienced what God's power can do. As an army of peace, 
It's our joy, not our job. It's our joy to go out into the world and share that overflow with our neighbors. People are watching. People are watching the way we treat our spouses. They're watching the way that we treat our coworkers. They're watching whether or not we make friends with that really annoying person in the office. They are noticing. And it's not about putting on a show. There's no way that I could fake it when it comes to breaking a cinder block. There is no way. And when you get it wrong breaking a cinder block, it hurts. It doesn't feel good. There's no way to fake it. You have to have the strength and the conditioning and the training. You have to have that time in the studio to be prepared and ready to do that. It's the same way when it comes to meeting people on the streets. It's not about faking it. It's not about putting on a show and trying to act correctly to attract people to Jesus. Jesus is already attractive enough. He doesn't need our help. Jesus just needs us to represent who he actually is. And we do that when we have consistent, honest, vulnerable time gathered on the porch. And when I get it wrong, and I do get it wrong often, when I get it wrong, when instead of bringing love and compassion and healing to the streets, I bring chaos, or I bring brokenness, or I add to the destruction, when I get it wrong, the good news for me, the gospel truth, is that it's not over. The good news for me is that when I get it wrong, that's simply my cue to look back at my porch time and to say, have I been consistent? Have I been honest? Have I been vulnerable? And nine times out of ten, when I get it wrong in the world, when I don't represent Jesus in the street, the answer is no, I haven't been consistent or honest or vulnerable. And that's the moment where the good news, the gospel tells us we have the opportunity to go back. To go back and say, Lord, I got it wrong this time. And he hugs us and he says, I still love you. I still love you. And you get another chance. We get to go back on the porch, be refueled, refilled, retrained, reconditioned, and re-sent out to give it another shot. Some soldiers might disagree with this, but I think the army doesn't train just to train. My husband says that's not true. But (laughs) I think, ideally, they wouldn't train just for the sake of training. They train so they can go out and execute. For an army of peace, it's the same way. We do this. We gather, not just to train, but so that we can go out and execute. And so right now, in our last minutes together on the porch, in our last moments together, gathered with each other, focused on the Father and his love for us, let's commit to being consistent and honest and vulnerable. One of the ways that can be really helpful to do that is by asking ourselves some questions. Um, And I have a couple. The first that I'd like us to ask ourselves in this last time together is, do I gather on the porch? And you guys are all here right now this morning, so big check mark. That's that's a great start. Um, Bonus points. Um, But also, do I gather during the week? Do I have organic times with other followers of Jesus? Do I meet with a family on mission, with a missional community, so I can be honest and vulnerable with them? Do I have personal time with the Father? Do I gather on the porch? And when I do, am I being honest and vulnerable and consistent? Or am I distracted? Do I just go through the motions? The second question is this. Do I bring healing in the streets? Do I bring healing? A good way to ask this, um, I think, would be if someone saw me, saw Becky, operating in the world, and they had never heard of a Christian before, they had never heard of a follower of Jesus, what would they say a follower of Jesus is? What would they write about what I'm doing? What would they believe it meant to be a Christian? And the final question is this. Who is standing off the porch in my life right now? Who is standing off the porch that could use healing or love or kindness or compassion or grace? And it might be someone that we see every day. It might be someone we haven't seen in 10 years. 
It might be that person that we pass by on the street, that other 20 other people have passed by that God is calling us to stop and notice. But asking, Lord, who is off the porch in my life that you want me to introduce Jesus to? Who needs to experience Jesus? Next week, we're starting to dig into that new series, right? And we're going to hear about what it means to live in the reality of resurrection. And I think it's so critical that our time off the porch, our encounters with the world, point right back to that reality, to that reality of a resurrection life, to the truth that Jesus is alive, a life that displays that out of the overflow of our time on the porch.